This is um, third in the series of our teachings looking at Psalms 32.5. This one little verse we've gotten so much out of. By the way, did you know that uh, David wrote Psalm 32 right after his affair with Bathsheba? And we've been looking under the covers so to speak, um, of this verse. uh, In in this translation, we're looking to find every Hebrew word so that we can make sure we really understand what David was writing. And boy, does the original text have some wonderful imagery in it. Um, This is another seminary Bible school level teaching, by the way. And uh, so get your journals out and um, uh, take notes, look up the scriptures, read the scriptures along with me as we go. And then during the week, next week, uh, study this stuff out for yourself. Uh, If you'll study this in the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, I am sure he'll reveal to you even more than what I'm teaching. Now, this is my prayer for you that a spirit of revelation will be active in us to show us things that we've never seen before, things that will revolution our lives in Jesus. As as I was preparing this teaching, uh, Debbie asked me something. She said, uh, isn't this a little scary to you, finding out uh, so many mistranslations in the Bible? I mean, when do you know you're reading what the author wrote? And um, uh, when do you know you're reading a mistaken translation? How do we know? And I replied, well, honey, (laughs) that's kind of the point of these teachings is to challenge and encourage people to study things out for themselves. If you have a doubt or maybe you hear a whisper from the Holy Spirit as you're reading a scripture, look it up, dig into it. You know, seek out what the Lord's trying to say here. Uh, Do it in listening prayer. And let the Lord reveal His true heart to you. So let's look at Psalm 32, verse 5. Again, let's read that as we uh, get ready to study this out this morning. I'm going to read this as it was written in my translation. And then we're going to read along knowing the, the mistranslations we found. In other words, we're going to read along... Uh, and kind of retranslate as to what David actually wrote. So my translation says, I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Selah. So the, what David actually wrote was, I acknowledged my sin to you, no change there, And my perverted, twisted sin nature, I did not hide from you. I said, I will confess my rebellions to Yahweh. And you lifted up and carried away my sin nature. Now pause and calmly think about that. (laughs) That's what David wrote. So last time, we started talking about this first phrase, sin. That's a word we didn't have to retranslate. That's what it meant. I'll not hide my sin. And we established the last time a definition of sin. And that is, while technically sin is disobeying God in His commandments in any way, the only sin that counts against us in eternity are those acts of disobedience that we knew were wrong when we did them. As we saw in Romans 2, 14. Let's just go there real quick. Romans 2, verse 14 through 16. Romans 2, 14 says, And when Gentiles, who do not have the Torah, uh, the, that's the, the law of Israel, um, when they do instinctively the things of the Torah, These not having the law or the Torah are a law to themselves. And that they show in the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness 
and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men's hearts through the anointed one, Jesus. So Paul is saying here that if you didn't have the written law of Torah, you still have a law written on your heart. And so if your conscience tells you that you have done something wrong, then on the day of judgment, that's going to stand against you as sin. If your conscience doesn't condemn you in what you did, then what you did was not a sin that would be counted against you in judgment. And I want to continue with that thought and a refinement on that thought. Let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, 8. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 through 12. 1 Corinthians 8, 8. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither worse if we do eat, nor better if we don't eat. Why is he talking about food? What in the world could that have to do with sin? Well, what he's talking about here is in that day, People often offered their food to, God, to idols. As a matter of fact, some idol temples were actually meat markets. They'd offer the meat to the idols and then they'd sell that meat. And so this is what Paul is talking about. Essentially food or especially meat that's been offered to idols. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. This liberty of you knowing <clears throat> that that meat is just... It's not offered to anything, really. And so, who cares if they offered it to an idol? It's just meat. You can eat it. That's the liberty that you have. But he's saying there are others that don't have that liberty. They might be weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. In other words, the weak guy eating in that temple knows it's wrong to him, and so he gets condemned. And so you're ruining your brother uh, who, for the sake of Christ, died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Jesus. So, if you encourage someone to go against their conscience, then you have not only caused them to sin, but you actually sin against them and against Jesus. Let me give you an illustration in modern terms, okay? Let's say that I was raised um, that it's okay to take a drink of wine occasionally. That's how my family raised me. As long as nobody gets drunk, it's okay to take an occasional glass of wine. And to me, having a little wine at dinner is no big deal. It's not a sin. But let's say that you were raised in an environment where you were taught that letting alcohol touch your lips at any time is a sin. And so you were taught that for sure it's a sin to drink wine ever. Now, let's say that I come along, we become friends, I invite you over to our house for dinner, and now as we get acquainted, I have discovered that you made it clear to me that you don't drink alcohol of any kind. But I'm going to try to free you up a little, okay? And so I go ahead and serve wine at dinner, and we encourage you. And we tell you, oh, it's okay to take a little wine. You can have some. And you take a sip of wine. Immediately, your conscience tells you that that was wrong. Did you sin when you sipped that wine? Absolutely. Did I sin against you in enticing you to sin. Yes, absolutely, I did. If I had done that, I would have been playing right along with the devil's team. Understand how that works? So sin is counted against you only if you think that what you were doing was wrong. Now, how do we deal with sin? We started in Psalm 32 when David said that he acknowledged 
his sin. Well, it's actually the Holy Spirit that convicts us of our sin, and he does that through our conscience. And however it happens, we become aware of sin. Now what? Well, this very next step is to acknowledge the sin to God, our loving Heavenly Daddy, and ask Him for forgiveness. Turn to 1 John 8. 1 John 8. God one. No, I'm sorry. 1 John 1. 1 John 1. We're going to start in verse 8. We're going to read verses 8 through 9 of 1 John 1. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay? We're all like David. We've sinned. Now what? If we confess our sins, He is, ju- is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we'll confess our sins, God will forgive us and He'll cleanse us. What happens when God forgives our sins? Turn to Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1. God wants to forgive us. He wants to forgive you probably more than you want to be forgiven. Never hesitate. When you realize I've sinned, go to God immediately. Isaiah 1, 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they will be like fresh white wool. Your sins are washed away. They're not covered over somehow. You're not still carrying them with you. Isaiah 43 Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Another famous scripture. Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am the one. This is the Lord talking. Who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. I do it because I want to, says the Lord. And I will not remember your sins. Remember the picture of Psalm 32, 5? where it says that God literally lifts up and carries away our sin. The scapegoat rocket (laughs) that carries away our sin, right? It blasts off with our sin on it and never to return to us again. It's gone, forgotten. But there's something else that happens when we're forgiven. Turn to Hebrews 9. I love this part and we don't want to miss this part of what happens when God forgives us. Hebrews 9 verse 14 Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more will the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that blood of Jesus cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Jesus that washes away our sin also cleanses our conscience. Do you know what that really means? That's saying that God actually makes us innocent so that our conscience is no longer condemning us. He wants us to have a clear conscience. He wants us to feel that after he's forgiven us. If I could do only one thing today, if I could somehow get to you the revelation of what it means to be innocent, I would be happy if that's the only thing I communicated today. Lord, send us that spirit of revelation. Reveal to us the breadth and the depth of what it means to be made innocent. Lift off of us the weight of, and the shame of guilt that we carry around us so that we can be free to serve you from that place of innocence and freedom. Okay, <clears throat> so dealing with sins easy, right? But how do we train our children to deal with sin? Because uh, we know that God forgives us and he forgets our sin. How do we explain to our children that God forgives and forgets our sins? But sometimes we have to punish them for their sin. Huh. Well, believe me, as the kids get older, especially when they become teenagers, they pick up on this... um, 
this contradiction and they're going to start questioning you and challenging you over it. And so you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit give you an argument that you can use with your children. It helps them understand how God can completely forgive, but you may still have to punish them or, or discipline or chastise them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you how I do it. And you don't have to do it this way. Just I'm going to give you some food for thought, okay? And so I start off by explaining this, explaining this old adage that God always forgives, man sometimes forgives, and nature never forgives. Okay, what do I mean by nature never forgives? Well, you know what? If I walked off of a 10-story building, what's going to happen to me? Well, I mean, gravity is immediately going to take over and splat, and I'm going to go to my death, right? Now, what if just as I step off that building, I say, gravity, I didn't mean to step off that building. Please forgive me. <laughs> Will gravity stop pulling me toward Earth? <laughs> no, it won't. Nature never forgives. But man sometimes forgives. You know, there are bad, rebellious, and law-breaking people in this world, and we've all known some of them. Uh, the worst of them we call criminals. Uh, we don't, they don't care anything about you. They just want to do what they want to do. And the rest of us law-abiding citizens sometimes need protection from criminals. And so sometimes that protection comes from us uh, locking them up for a long time in jail, you know. Or maybe that protection comes from us rehabilitating them so that they don't commit crimes in the future. Uh, that rehabilitation process is what we might call discipline. We give them a punishment that makes them decide that they, from then on, want to do what's right. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 12, talk about this idea of discipline. Hebrews 12 and 7 says, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father doesn't discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which we've all become partakers, then you're illegitimate children. You're not sons if you don't get discipline. Furthermore, we have earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them for doing that. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us. Our earthly fathers disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. But He, God, disciplines us always for our own good so that we may share in His holiness. All discipline at the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Fathers who love their children discipline their children with what you might call chastening or punishment. Uh, negative consequences for their actions. So, you know, we might not be criminals, um, uh, but we're not perfect either. And occasionally we need some discipline to get us back on track. We have a concept in this country uh, about criminals. And that concept with criminals is once you have paid your debt to society then we're going to count you as uh, having been free of punishment. Now you can be forgiven of whatever it was you've done. And so in the realm of human affairs, uh, discipline and punishment sometimes has to precede forgiveness so that the offending behavior, whatever it is, can be changed so that it, you won't need to be punished over and over again in the future. Okay, And so we say man sometimes forgives. But God always forgives. And this is where the great difference comes in. When it comes to our eternal spirits, if we let sin accumulate on our spirits without forgiveness, I'm telling you, our eternal spirits are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. The Jews saw sin as a dirty spot on your spirit. And I think they're right. It's not part of you, but if left unattended, it will drag you into eternal torment. 
And so this is where God comes along and he says, I have made provision for your forgiveness. All you have to do is repent and ask me to forgive you and I, God, will forgive you. I'll wash away the sin. I'll forget all about it. I'll write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and you can look forward to spend eternity with me in the New Jerusalem. And, but let's look at the extreme, okay? Let's say you cheated on a, uh, on a high school test, okay? It's an important exam and you were caught cheating. You go to God while you're waiting outside the principal's office <laughs> to face the consequences of what you did. You go to God right away and you say, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me. Guess what? The Lord forgives you, right? But that doesn't mean that you're not going to have to face some consequences for what you did. Uh, what you did was wrong. And so there's going to be some manly uh, uh, human punishment associated with that. God forgiving and man forgiving are not necessarily connected. God always forgives. And so this is how I approached it. So, child, as your parent, it's our responsibility to train you how to serve God. And that training might sometimes involve consequences and punishments. And that's to help you, to help encourage you to become the right kind of person. We'll always forgive you, but we may have to discipline you first. And we want you to ask God's forgiveness right away. And after you repent to us and face your consequences and punishment, then we want to forgive you and we want to do just like God does. We want to forget all about it. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? I can give you some ideas about how to approach this idea of sin and forgiveness with your children. Well, so sin counts against us when we do wrong and we know that what we did was wrong when we did it. Our conscience is the mechanism that God has built into us that acts as our guide when it comes to sin. If my conscience tells me I sinned, then I sinned. But if we repent, God is always quick to forgive our sins. He washes away our sins. He forgets about them. And then if we'll let him, he'll actually cleanse our conscience. He'll make us truly innocent. Don't let sin stay on your spirit. Repent and get rid of it right away. God loves to forgive us. Now, the next verse or in uh, the next phrase in Psalm 32, 5 deals with God dealing with our twisted, perverted sin nature. And I want to get to that next time. What I want to do uh, real quick is I want to go back to Isaiah 53. Now that we know what these words mean, I want us to look at Isaiah 53 with that knowledge and truly understand what Jesus did for us on the cross. I want, to sh I want to show you how God has made provision to remove our sin nature. I want to make sure that you get a clear picture of that from the Bible. But first, you need to understand what Jesus did on the cross. So let's go through these verses in Isaiah 53. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5. And we're going to look at them with the proper Hebrew words. Now, I want to read them without the corrections, okay? Uh, Psalm 53, 3 through 5. Read along with me in your Bible so you'll see uh, how it's originally written. And this is pretty consistent with most translations. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. This is a prophecy about Jesus, right? Surely our griefs he bore himself and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being, or in, your, in some translations it may say peace, 
uh, fell upon him, and by his scourgings we are healed. Now, let's take a quick look at some of the words in these verses, okay? So verses 3 through 4 says a couple of times, uses the word sorrows. As it turns out, that word sorrow is probably a pretty good translation. It means anguish or pain or sadness, okay? So we'll accept the translation like that. But what about that word grief? That's used a couple of times too. Um, uh, He was acquainted with grief. Uh, he He bore our grief. That word grief is actually the Hebrew word for sickness or disease. It's used 22 times in the Old Testament, and in every other place of the Old Testament, it's translated sickness or disease or affliction. But here, the two times it's used here, it's translated as grief. You know, I don't understand that. It's almost as if the translators were trying to cover up the meaning of what Jesus was going to do for us on the cross, how he was going to carry, not our grief, he was going to carry our sickness and disease to the cross. Now in verse 5, we know that uh, usually where transgressions and iniquities are used, uh, and it's true in this case too, transgression means rebellion, and iniquities means our twisted, perverted sin nature. Uh, What my translation says well-being is the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace in every kind of way you can imagine. And then uh, that last, the last word in verse 5 is healed, and that means mended or cured of sickness and disease. So there's no doubt about what that's talking about, right? So now let's read Isaiah 53, 3 through 5 with the corrections. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with sickness and disease. And like one from whom men hid their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our sickness and our disease he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our rebellions He was crushed for our twisted, perverted sin nature. The chastening of our shalom fell upon him. And by his scourgings, we are mended and we are cured of our sickness and disease. Uh, Today, when we receive communion together, there are going to be some people that will experience this. uh, You're going to be touched and healed as we receive communion. Now, so do you see what I mean um, uh, about what Jesus did for us on the cross? He took our sorrows. He took our sicknesses. He took our rebellion and our sin nature. I mean, you know, it says in Psalm 53, uh, I mean, in Psalm 32, 5, there, the second part, he lifted these things off of us and he carried them away. This is, this is the way... Uh, This is way more than a single exchange for the penalty of sin. This is way more than just paying the price for sin so we don't have to, okay? This is lifting off of us, not just the guilt of sin, but it's lifting off of us sickness and disease. It's lifting off of us our tendency to rebel against God. It's lifting off of us our twisted, perverted sin nature that encourages us to sin. And as we saw in, uh, in Hebrews 12, it's even lifting off of us uh, the guilt of our conscience. So Jesus didn't just pay the price for our guilt. He literally lifted off of us all of the effects that sin brought into this broken world. All the sin, all the disease, all the brokenness, all the perversion, all the rebellious spirits, the guilt, the shame, along with the works of the devil. That's what God took off of us. What a package. All we have to do is believe that, accept that, and walk in it. And how do we walk in it? Well, we don't really walk in it, okay? We let him walk it out through us. 
And now that you know the theology of Isaiah 53, 3 through 5, we're going to talk next time about how do we let him walk this out so that our perverted sin nature is taken away from us and we don't have to live in it.